It's a good chance when you're watching this, it's going to be early in the month of June. We're going to do some videos highlighting some of our best stock ideas for the month. And that's actually, we're going to start off with this video and talk about, you've got a stock, you say it's one of your best ideas. I've got a stock I think is one of my best ideas. I think you'll approve of mine. I know I like yours. Let's go. I, I, always times to get at top of the month. Everyone wants new stock ideas. So let's share some of the best ones we got right now. Awesome. Before we get to the details though, just a reminder, we have a great partnership with the Motley Fool. The Fool sponsors this video. We've got two great stock ideas we're going to discuss in this video. If you're looking for even more great stock ideas, I really encourage you to go to our special link. It's fool.com forward slash unscripted. Again, fool.com forward slash unscripted. You see it on the screen. Go to that link. The Motley Fool is going to give you its 10 best stocks to buy right now. That's a dozen great stock ideas. One video and one link. One link away. All right, check that out after the video. Tyler, how about you kick it off? You got an oil company you think is just a, a buy right now. I do. And I want to, I'm, I'm going to contextualize a little bit because that's what I do. And we, we love to talk. So let's work this out here a little bit. I want to talk about the oil and gas cycle, right? What we've seen lately is we've seen a lot of consolidation in the oil and gas industry, right? It, Exxon Mobil's buying Pioneer. Chevron wants to buy Hess. We just saw the ConocoPhillips and Marathon oil tie up. This is a very normal thing that you see in the oil cycle where basically like over the previous several years, it was very depressed, but things are getting better. And typically when things start to get really good, but not good enough to start spending large amounts of money on new development, new exploration, and valuations are still relatively cheap, you see these big waves of consolidation because it's just cheaper to buy somebody else's production rather than try to find some of the stuff on your own. Oil prices go higher, then you start to actually explore for your own. So we're still very much in that period where the market's kind of saying publicly traded oil companies are still pretty cheap. And so with that in mind, this is one that you and I have talked about before here, and one that I, I particularly like, despite it got getting nearly as much attention, is Equinor. And this is the Norwegian state-owned oil company, but it's also publicly traded. The reason that I like Equinor so much is that it has some of the lowest cost production in the world. The Norwegian continental shelf is one of the lowest cost production areas. It's very prolific. It's very long-term production. So unlike shale in the U.S., where you got to drill uh, new wells every year, year and a half before they start to deplete, you know, offshore stuff can last a decade or two or three, depending on how you do it, if you do it right. And so with that in mind, you have a company that, you know, basically saying it like 30, $35 per barrel, we can pretty much do everything we want to do, pay our dividends, do our capital exploration and all that stuff. And even they have a relatively ambitious renewable energy program, especially when it comes to offshore wind. That's a big, it's a big one for them. So everything seems to indicate that they are in a very good position and don't have a lot of, you know, high cost, expensive, lavish projects that, that are going to, you know, drain cash flows for some time. And so the company has been returning copious amounts of cash over the last several years. We've talked about it paying special dividends and buying back a lot of stock and stuff like that. And even today, they've kind of tempered that a little bit with the expectation that spending on their renewable projects is going to go up a little bit here. But even with that expectation, you have what a, a combined yield. So basically the combination of your dividend yield and your buyback yield is somewhere in the like 14 to 15% range. So, but you know, about a 7% dividend yield and about a six and a half, seven percent buyback over the past year in terms of total shares outstanding. Basically what that means is the buybacks that they've done, they've bought back so much stock, your equity in the company by not buying another single share has increased by that percentage. You own that much more without buying any more shares, plus the yield on the trading price of the stock. It's, it's just such a wonderful shareholder friendly business right now. I, I think a lot of people focus so much on the dividend yield because like, yeah, that's the cash that you get in your pocket. But shareholder right. yield, it can be a little bit more powerful, especially if you're not dependent on income and are looking for like total returns. You buybacks plus dividends plus growth can be, you know, you start adding all those things up and all of a sudden you've got a pretty, pretty good combination. Something it's in that 14 and a half, 15% range. That is, that is very, very good, especially for like you know, oil companies, relatively slow growth cyclical businesses, because when you have a, a return like that, let's, you know, think about it from the terms of like 
an index fund, the S&P 500, what, over the past 20, 30, 40 years, we say 11 and a half, 12%. So if I'm getting a couple of percentage points above that, simply in dividends and buybacks, to me, that's a pretty good valuation. And at the same time, any growth that we see in the coming years from, you know, the volatility in, in oil prices, and it's still pretty lucrative today. And if you want to use traditional valuation metrics, it's only trading for like eight times earnings. And that's considerably cheaper than if you want to look at, say, the more well-known integrated oil and gas companies like Exxon, Mobil, Chevron, which are trading in the, you know, 12 to 14 range for their price earnings ratio lately. Yeah, I, I like Econor too. I, I own a small amount. And Tyler, I've been pondering making a move. I've got some offshore oil and gas drilling contractors. The stocks have done quite well. While I've watched Equinor continue to kind of be a laggard, and I'm actually considering rotating that money into Equinor because it remains to me so deeply undervalued and is so, so well run. So I fully support anybody that wants to take a closer look at that company. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take us a little bit different direction. This is a company that I know you are deeply familiar with. And you also have some investment in, it's been a big long-term winner, and that's Brookfield Renewable. That is uh, Brookfield on your bingo cards. There you go. That's right. That's right. I, I only mention it every other, every other video that we do, one of the Brookfield companies. No, I, I, I don't, but it feels that way sometimes. But so Brookfield Renewable, the reality, Tyler, is that the renewable energy industry, as much as it has been a net benefit for global energy production, offsetting carbon offsetting emissions, it has been a value destroyer by and large for retail investors. The public companies have struggled because of that race to the bottom and it's highly cyclical. And when I say race to the bottom, this massive drop in cost per watt to produce power has been massively good for the industry because now it can compete with anything the fossil fuel industry can produce on a, on a dollar to dollar basis to generate electricity. Because of that race to the bottom, like all the solar panel manufacturing companies, all the electronics manufacturing companies by and large have really struggled and investors have been burned. But Brookfield Renewable, for the most part, has been an excellent investment over the past decade. A combination of two things. Number one, the share value increasing. And then 1A, growing the dividend that they pay. It's rewarded investors incredibly. And a big part of the reason, Tyler, this has been such a great investment over the long term is because they benefit from the thing that's been the, the, the most challenging part of the industry for a lot of the companies. And that's all of those lower costs because of their business, which is developing and investing in renewable energy production facilities. So utility scale solar, utility scale wind. Also, a lot of they've moved a lot into a distributed solar. So like rooftop solar on commercial uh, locations like on a parking garage or parking deck or on top of a, a big box retailer or a mall, like that sort of distributed commercial solar. All the tailwinds have been good for that part of the business to actually make money. You sign these long-term contracts, you know what your costs are going to be, you know generally what you're going to generate in terms of cash flows off of those contracts. Uh, and then this is the thing that's made that work better than everybody else is they're just really good at doing it. They have really smart people allocating the capital they're very value oriented. They don't overpay. You listen to their conference calls and they talk about missing deals, losing deals because they're really disciplined and they won't overpay. And then they're also really good sellers too. Once they have assets that maybe kind of reach a certain level of, of, of maturity where their ability to grow it, expand it isn't necessarily great. Or maybe they just have a, a really interested buyer that's looking to purchase those cash flows they'll sell it generally for a higher multiple than they acquired it for, right? And then they take that, those proceeds and then they go find the next thing that they want to buy. They've just been exceptionally, exceptionally good at that. And I want to highlight a, a recent deal they did that I think makes, makes the company really attractive to me because it demonstrates so much of what they're good about. So I'm going to do a stock chart here first. And this shows, you see right here, May 1st, the stock price shot up a lot, shot up you know, about 7 or 8% in a single day. Conversely, the dividend yields come down because the stock price has moved up a lot, but it moved up because they announced a massive deal with Microsoft. They're saying that this is the largest contract of its kind that's ever been signed. It's a PPA. It's a standard power purchase agreement for these sorts of deals. Here's what makes it so exciting right here. It's to produce, to deliver over 10.5 gigawatts of new power capacity. I want to put that in perspective because that that number might not mean much to anybody, but the company today generates from their entire utility scale 
solar business, 7.2 gigawatts. So they're talking about th this one deal is larger than their entire utility scale solar business today and is not that much smaller than their existing wind business today. It is a massive, massive deal. Also, Tyler, I, I like the fact that it, it seems like they have a pretty big window of development. It's expected to be completed by 2030. They're not really starting rolling that out until 2026. So it's you know five years of development that they're talking about. So there's plenty of time to develop it and follow like the Brookfield way to do it. And I think it's going to create a tremendous amount of value for investors in terms of future cash flows that they're going to generate from it. And that has moved this stock, even though the stock price has gone up, it's just a reminder that they're so good at what they do, that the big players that are looking for more renewable energy come to Brookfield and then Brookfield takes those opportunities and goes out and makes money for its investors. Yeah. The only thing I would add to that is Brookfield certainly has not been afraid to grow just simply by waiting for somebody else to screw up, which is something that happens very frequently in the renewable energy space. You also have to consider there's probably a lot of other higher risk developers right now that may not have the cost of capital advantages that Brookfield has, may have stretched themselves a little too thin. And rather than thinking of this as a, you know, development of new solar option, it may just be a, hey, two years from now, somebody big is going to blow up and we'll just go buy all their stuff and then we can just cover this and it'll be a great return. Something I would consider with this.